My office also was visited by Mr. Jim Goodenow. He's a veteran from my district and an active member of the Veterans for Peace. Mr. Goodenow has traveled all over the country from his home based in Terlingua, Texas, abroad his bus duped the Yellow Rose. He has been spreading the message of peace for many years. You know, I just, uh, I believe in what you're doing. Thank you, Mom. You're welcome. All right, love you, Mom. All right, go get him. But don't get arrested. So we're here at the 2007 Vets for Peace Convention in St. Louis, um, an important time in history. Uh, peace lovers, peace activists, war resistors, war veterans, all strategizing, working together to find solutions to think of how to win, how to end this war. Hello, hello. How you doing, man? Doing great. Good seeing you nice again. Nice to see you. I need you to think. <laughs> Concept, right? I signed up for the military because I come from a poor farming rural town and I was bored. And I needed an escape and I wanted college money because I knew I'd never be able to afford on my own to go to college. So I signed up for the, for the army. Rebuild the Gulf Coast. Give me a I signed up in the Clinton era that I was against the war before the war started, basically. And once 9-11 once happened, I just kind of went like, oh shit, I just made a huge mistake. And so that's the conversation that we have to have. How do we stop this war and reprioritize the human needs of this country? So welcome to St. Louis, and I look forward to the weekend. A lot of the members of Iraq Veterans Against the War are like guys who went and believed in it and then when they were there something changed their minds and made them realize that it's it's not true and it's all a lie. But but someone like me went through it because I was afraid if I didn't I'd go to jail. So it was like I, I signed up, I, I realized I made a mistake and then I did something I knew I was gonna hate and uh, it was something that, that it took me a long time to come to terms with, was willingly doing something that I thought to be wrong and bad and evil. What we have to do is to take on two major parties. We have to take on the Republicans and we have to take on the Democrats. The war's been going on for four, almost five years now, and we still, we still haven't succeeded in the ending it yet. And frankly, to me personally, every day I wake up and I realize the war is going on still, and it's like it's, it breaks my heart every day to realize that we keep failing. Like, we're making a little bit of progress, but every day we go to sleep not succeeding in our ultimate goal. And I'm not going to stop until we do succeed. We gotta do it fast because every single day we're having three to five to ten Americans killed, 200 Iraqis being killed every day. I mean, it's up to us. If we want this war to end, we've got to buck it up. We've got to buck it up and we've got to come up with some more creative ideas of how we get, as Jamala said, how do we get the African American community in there? How do we get the Latino community? These communities that are the ones that are probably the most affected at all because they are the kids that are joining the military. While I was there in St. Louis, I spent a lot of time with both the Veterans for Peace and also the Iraq Veterans Against the War, who were working closely together to build a stronger peace movement. Across the street was another convention called the Black Job Expo, where they had actors like Nick Cannon and the military had a war simulator. My name is Fernando Suarez del Solar. I am a father of Jesus Alberto. He died in March 27, 2003 in Iraq. And I come in for the Veterans for Peace Convention, working for peace and country recruiter. But the surprise is when the, the front of the hotel, I find this uh, label fair or whatever name, and I find 
find the recruiters here, the Army, Marines, and my opinion is very immoral and corruption. The military is coming here next to the universities, next to the education system, for trying to involve the young people for the war. You believe that can simulate what real war is like, right? Well, yeah, we went on a convoy one time, and that's pretty much what it was like. We had some trailers, we were doing some, uh, yeah, some of that. Now, I guess, uh, well, it's missing a couple of things. The, I, I'm sure the bullets and the shrapnel, the IEDs, are probably on the other side that we can't see. I'm sure it's there. The Iraq veterans covered the convention with counter-recruitment literature and organized a protest outside of the war simulator. done by these veterans just now. Well, they mean they're they're for the they fought under the they their opinion, they right, that's what we fight for. Thank you, sir. My name is Juan Torres, a gold star father. My only son, John Torres, died in July 12, 204, in Bagran, Afghanistan. Fernando Suarez de Sula. Our father, my son, Jesus Alberto, died in March 27, 2003, in Iran. My name is Carlos Arredondo. I'm from Costa Rica. My son, born in Boston, Massachusetts. He served the Marines. He went to Iraq and he served two tours in Iraq. At the age of 20 years old, he was killed in a job. My name is Al Zapala. My son, Sherwood Baker, was killed in Baghdad. April 26, 2004. Minutes later, the fathers ran into some active duty Marines and had a chance to talk with them. I was in Korea in 1950 from uh, September to December when I was wounded. Um, 
You know, I'm convinced that war doesn't solve any kind of disputes. I've been opposed to war ever since I was in one. And uh, I, come, I come to the Vets for Peace convention. It recharges me all the time it, to be amongst these people that think the same way and know that what we're doing in this war is so illegal, so immoral, so obscene. We have to fight it. We have to get rid of this administration that is profiting from this war. Our people are over there dying because of, of their goals, their imperialistic goals, their war, their war for resources and so on. That's why I'm here. Jim, how long have you been a protester? Oh, you go back to the days of Vietnam, I reckon, you know, we're talking back to the 60s, so there's 40 years, and uh, let's see, let's put on a couple more here, because about 47 years. If you look right up there, pan to that bus, that's the bus we were driving back in 1974, went cross country in that. So we've been around the block a few times, a few times, but never saw a rascal like the one we got in there now. Carlos Ordondo and dozens of protesters sat beneath the arch and made a human peace sign. I want everybody to think of George Bush and Dick Cheney in 2008 at the Hague World Criminal yeah! Court. Yeah! Yeah! Bill Gilson, Chapter 34, New York City. My first convention, it was tremendous. With bets for peace. Huey Bruce, Chapter 34, Brooklyn, New York. It's great to be here with fellow fighters for the cause of peace. Thanks. Jim Goodnow and I left St. Louis that afternoon for what would be an epic cross-country adventure. Woo! Ohio! Ohio, Buckeye State! As soon as Jim and I got on the road, we instantly knew we were on the same wavelength. And when people would give Jim the finger, he'd pull out this cross and try to track him down. I would go on to travel across the East Coast on this bus with Jim Goodnow during the height of the Iraq War protests. Jim would come to Philadelphia on a regular basis for several reasons. First, there was a ship captain who would make biodiesel that the bus was able to use. He also kept a station wagon in the city of Philadelphia that he called the Mothership. And right across the street was free bus parking. Ideas being implanted in thinkers' minds. Can't really turn away yet, he's got to read one more. And look at what this bus says on it. Hmm, morning thoughts on a morning walk. Now we're 
southbound from Philadelphia going to County Buckleport, Maine. Hey, do me a favor. Pick up that hubcap right there. What right there. Just, just bring it in. Are you filming this? You th currently thinks you're insane at the moment. But you currently thinks that the captain's insane. Does not know why we're picking up these hubcaps. I have no idea why you're picking More up More to be revealed. I shall tell you about the great <sighs> hubcap caper, okay? Okay. It's a very important deed you just did, young man. This is the Bessie Ross Bridge, and we're leaving Philadelphia. We're leaving the state of Pennsylvania. Crossing the Delaware, not too far from where George crossed a long time ago. Not George, well yeah, it's George W., but it was the real George W. The W and the George I'm talking about stands for Washington. These are the hubcaps that young Miles, my trusted crew member, recently risked his life in heavy traffic. However, it was going quite slowly on the I-95 over Philadelphia to bring aboard the Yellow Road. Now, why would I send my newfound crew member on such a mission? Ta-da! 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 Ta -da, ta -da. Now, is that a piece of beauty or not? And folks, that's a hubcap. This is recycling in its finest state. Collie Ryan lives on the border, right on the Rio Grande River, in a gypsy wagon, an old school bus, about 1936. It's so old that the engine is no longer in it. The tires are threadbare, but it's a beautiful gypsy wagon. Collie paints these hubcaps that are donated to her from travelers such as us. As you can see, it's quite an artwork. My yachting days, and those yachts like that. We got a pretty good yacht right here. We're here on the Hudson River. There you go, New York City, all the way down to your right. This is so different from where I live. On our way through Massachusetts, a cop pulled us over and gave us a bogus ticket. We're currently getting pulled over. Failed to pull right for emergency vehicle. I think we were harassed here. If you look here at the traffic, there's all kinds of traffic. It rides in the left lane. There's nothing here that says no vehicles allowed in left lane. We then crossed the Merrimack River and entered the state of New Hampshire. What's it mean? Live free or die? How come I gotta pay? Well, you probably have to look right inside, but there's a picture right over here of that uh, windshield right there of a 1954 Chevy school bus that I drove across the country in 1973 and 74. It's an impeachment. We started an impeachment movement back then, and we were logged in for it as uh, impeachment. We also to end the war in Vietnam. When the current situation broke such as it has now, we see a great similarity between the times of now and the times of then. Something. Countless, countless rallies. My lord, I've made most of the major ones in Washington, D.C. We go to events out in uh, Minnesota, Chicago. We've been down to Fort Benning, Georgia for the SOA. We go to the for these conventions, support the rallies, and in particular right now, we are very supportive of the Iraq veterans against the war. They've utilized this bus and I drive them for their uh, tours. They go to the military bases. They speak to active duty military personnel forming a GI resistance, if you will, from within. Remember, I'm a veteran, and as a veteran, we take an oath to defend this nation against enemies, both domestic and foreign. I'll tell you right now, we've got a problem here for the current administration. You can't have the blood on your hands that we have now. Folks, really listen, this is real. It's not a video game. There's over 600,000, maybe some reports say up a million Iraqis dead. These are basically innocent people, much like the people here we see. They're flesh and blood. We're all one family in this world. we got to get that real. I'm old enough to know that. I'm old enough to know what authority is and what it isn't. I don't fear the generals. I don't fear the politicians. They're supposed to be serving us, not us serving them. Let's get it right. Get it right now. Or, you know, the country's gone. You hear about the rally being here, number one. Number two, it isn't. Can't bump right now.
where the president's dad lives, the former president. I know we can find another president willing to say what Dwight David Eisenhower said over 40 years ago. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fires signifies in a final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed and those who are cold and are not clothed. The world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hope of its children. I want peace, and I want it now. Thank you. Yes, we're here in Canada, in Canada Corner today, and we're near the home of George Bush. But let's not, let's not deceive ourselves about this. The fact of the matter is that it was a Democratic Senate that let the war happen in 2002. It's a Democratic House and Senate that can stop it in 2007. Today is my son's third anniversary of his death in Iraq after he was serving two tours in Iraq. He died on August 25, 2004. Uh, we're here to to remember him and remember all the others and all the, the people who got caught up and died in this war. Today also is my birthday, the day my son died, and also we celebrate life at the same time we we remember all these people who who lose this who lose their life in this nonsense war. And in Kenny Van Port today is a very beautiful day. It's hundreds, hundreds of people participated and and it's wonderful to see the the people still going the streets and doing demonstration because it, it's very important. We have a lot of young men and young girls who are marching also, which I think is great because they are the future of this country, the future of the world, and it's good for them to see that this is democracy, you know, and we participate all together no matter what. I said, Steve, you count people. He says, yeah, and I said, how many? He says, 2,000, but there's more coming, you know? So the cops said 4,000. So I've been traveling on this path with Cindy Sheehan since the first summer, joining forces with them, being on the road for this whole tour we just did. This was an over-the-top, magnificent, absolutely wonderful experience for all of us. So, you know, this is, this. I mean, you talk about the good old days, and here we are with, you know, I'm my heroes, basically. And what's so special about this group of people is every single person here is here out of altruism. It has nothing to do with, I want to get more of my kick, or, you know, I want to get off, so I'll join together with a bunch of people and we'll amuse ourselves. This is, comes from a different, completely place, completely different place. So the result is all of us are just with exemplary humans. The following morning, I read some of the letters that Carlos's son Alex had wrote to his family while he was on his way back to Iraq. These were truly heartfelt letters that helped me to see the true cost of this war. Jim and I spent several days there in Kennebunkport, Maine, and I got to enjoy everything from swimming in the Atlantic Ocean to fresh lobster. We met up with the organizers of the march and checked out the newspapers that had been printed about it. Police in riot gear at a barricade near Walker's Point yeah, on see, Saturday. See, did you, you didn't go down what? the Walker's Point, but they, the, they left us go down the, the Walker's Point. Peace Walker went down there yeah. by himself and sat there and flashed the peace, and you oh. got like all the seals. Oh, look there. at that. That's great. Yeah. Isn't that a great shot with Peace Walker with a tattoo and all the police in front of us? Oh! This girl right here, she's a coping. I met her in Washington and she's, I, I call her butterfly because she's always in the, in she's every, from every, Ireland, she goes like right? that the event. Is she from Ireland? She lives here in, in, this, in this state right here. She's from fast. Ireland. Oh, that's a I like this part. Oh, I thought that was Ireland. It's very nice. Uh, up yeah. the coast, yeah, not the Irish coast. No, no, not no, that no, no, that's not that one. <laughs> And that's Bush's place. All of this property is all of Bush's place. I tell this guy why he's wearing a mask. Why are you covering your face? I'm not covering my face. I ask him, challenging him. Now I'm the one who challenges him, telling him, why are you covering your face? 
Ask me that. Why you cover your face? You don't see me cover my face. And he's insulting me with this little yeah. <laughs> microphone. And he never give me an answer. Why? Yeah, but look like it. Look at that. Look at his muscles. Liam. Liam. Bulging. He was. Liam's not that big a dude, man. <laughs> look at his mouth. I mean, does that tell it? Later that day, Jim and I met up with this female folk band and we filmed the Bush compound up close. With Emma's revolution in the lead, and we're creating a revolution. Meeting people. Meeting people. Surprising conversations. Oh yeah, right, right, right. involved or, you know, has some connections with the Bush family. Been here for 30 years and now this is what he's putting out. Things like the middle class is under attack by corporate greed. Believe it, believe it. It happened here in Kinabat Park. Jim, what inspired you to drive a bus cross country? Coffee. <laughs> Good water. Drink your beer. Right about that, we knew we were shoot out of luck. <laughs> so so drink your beer. Town, drink your beer. We hooked beer, up beer, with beer, Jill, beer. and then Jill said to Miles, oh, Miles, what the hell are you doing? doing? If you're 22. Shoot her, give me a happy birthday, Sprint, man. There, there you go. Now get a little. This is an example of a fine Boston lady, folks. Here you go. <laughs> They kept buying them drinks. <laughs> I'm a designated driver. I didn't have anything to do with it. Jim has had only cranberry and orange juice. He drives this bus cross country because he believes in it. He's an inspiration. I haven't told him yet, but I know it to be true already, and I know it's going to be even more true as we go on. I look up to the man like a father. It means a lot to me. Come on in here. You like the bus, sir? Well, we're just filming a little bit here. Where are you from? You're from Iraq? Yeah. By God. Oh, man. You're the one we're talking to because we think this war is a total farce. And we're so sorry for the over almost a million Iraqis that have been killed. And, and, and a million, two million refugees. You from Baghdad or where? Hey, park the car and talk to us a minute. Hey, hey man, how you doing? Hey, this is Ian. Oh, Ian. Yeah, we met up the road yeah. there a little bit. Come on board the road. Take a look at that newspaper on that chair there, Sarge. See why I asked you if you pumped iron that morning? Guy looks like he's a Sherman tank ready to launch on Mars. 
I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. What do you know? That's a beautiful thing, Liam. What was he saying to you? He said he was putting them down. Um. <laughs> Whatever it was, it got his attention. That guy was a douchebag. <laughs> he was. Seriously. And he's a fucking remember, coward because he wouldn't even show his fucking face. That's what really got pissed me off. I was yelling that at him. I was like, show your fucking face, you coward. Boy, he's a fascist provocateur. Guys are spineless jellyfish. I remember, I don't remember exactly what I said. That's yours, take it. No, you bet. Um, I don't remember exactly <laughs> what, like what got me well worked up that he said that time, but I went and like calmed down and talked to him later. Yeah. And uh, he made absolutely no sense about anything he said. He, was, he, he had the, the most off the wall ideas. That Amazing. We're just driving along here, not too far from the Concord Bridge. So and we're on the Route 2 Bridge. Not a, not a clue. These are linear descendants of the original people who stood on the Concord Bridge, I can tell. And that's probably Henry David Thoreau's grandson over there, and must be Emerson's people on the other side there, the spirits here. I think I can see and hear the foot plops of Paul Revere. And here we are. In beautiful New England. Yes, sir, you talk about the Patriots. This must be over. Full moon before. We love you! Bye bye! Just give me a big high five. Hey, bro! Somewhere. Hey, you got a bus on there. <laughs> this guy is one of the members. So tell us what's happening up here now. Politically. Oh man, politically these people going nuts around here. Yeah, you know, they're trying to get, I don't know what they're trying to do. They're undecided, you know. People like you have them all running, you know. They were they were against everything at first, but uh, before the war, now everybody's talking about they're against the war now, you know, because it's politically correct to be against the war now after all the lives have been killed. People dead and everything like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's nuts. What do you think about the elections and all? I mean, how about what are the Democrats? I mean, you know, they haven't moved with impeachment or anything. No, because they're scared. Everybody's scared. Yeah, they're scared. They're scared. Everybody's scared. They don't know. With these crooks they got in the office right about now, they they know they're a bunch of gangsters. That's all they are. Go to camera, that A bunch, of, a bunch of gangsters. That's all they are. A bunch of gangsters. That's all. And we're living with them. And we as American citizens, we're letting them get away with it. Somebody got to step up to the plate and knock them out the box. That's all that's to it. You know? That's all that's to it. Knock them out the box. That's all. Maybe we just got to do a little uh, sweeping with them. Yeah, we take, take your Lay machine. Lay them down and I'll sweep them up. You know? Take that machine down to Congress and run it through the Capitol. Oh, right? that's right. That's right. We wouldn't hurt to run it through the White House a little bit, right? That's right. That's you got right. enough room in there to, 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 to haul all that dirt? I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot to get in there. A lot to get in there, too. Heavy load. A heavy load. This is America, folks. The blue collar workers, the people doing whatever you see the people doing. This is the backbone and the fabric of this country. This represents, Q represents what's going down in this country. He knows what's going down. You can't fool a wise man with an alert mind, okay? Might be the backbone of the fabric, but you, you're the bone and you're the everything you gotta lay the fabric on, you know what I'm saying? Well, gotta, we're, gotta have that strength, gotta have that strength. All the time, bro. We're not gonna let this administration or anybody in this country Divide us. They're not going to divide the black man from the white man, from the brown man, from the red man, 
we're sticking together and we're taking our country back and the revolution's beginning now. Got to have it. Got to have it. It's going to be peaceful, nonviolent, like Dr. King. That's right. But we reclaiming it. Hugh's got his piece of machinery here. He's going to clean this mess up. And I'm going to carry the message in that piece of machinery up there. We got a convoy going. Right here you in beautiful it. downtown, somewhere near New Haven. Yeah. What's this now? This is New Haven. This, this is, is New Haven, Haven. Connecticut. Yeah. My man, my main man in Connecticut here, Brother Q. All, All right. right. Last All time right. I was here, tell him how high the snow was here. Oh, Q. man, the snow was knee deep up here. My yeah. man was out here getting ready to go in some deeper snow up in Maine. I got to get out here. And get I got to get there. out here too, yeah. Q. Yeah. Don't fail to call me. No. You I'll got a computer, right? Yeah, I got a computer. You got any more of these one good enough? All right. No, uh, yeah, give me a couple more of these. Okay, pass out to some of your friends. Yeah, because I passed out all those bumper stickers, you know? All right, bro. I know some people who got mad because I put them on their car. I turned around and put another one right back up there. Yeah. All right, Q. <laughs> right. On our way into New York City, we visited Jim's father's grave. Love your father. Thank you. We're blessed. Have that spirit with us. As we made our way into New York City, I was quite afraid of the chance of us getting pulled over again. We made our way past the headquarters of both Fox and NBC. We saw people going into the Dave Letterman show. We drove up Broadway to Times Square where we saw the naked cowboy and he gave us the peace sign. We gave one of our Impeach Bush bumper stickers to a guy driving a little rickshaw. One military commercial after another. One military commercial after another. That's a fight. Yeah, look at that. Let's give uh, another one. Did you want another one? Yeah. You Sarah? We met up with Sarah Flounders for a protest at Rockefeller Center where I ran into Huey Bruce, an activist from Vets for Peace that I had met in St. Louis. This was our second time to Philadelphia, but it would not be the last. We drove past Independence Hall and got ready for our trip to Washington, D.C. Think a push. Film him. That's Baltimore for you. They said uh, F Bush, didn't they? Turbo to today. Turbo. Baltimore Harbor. Home of Francis Scott T. Star Spangled Banner. The Baltimore Orioles. And Johnny United. Johnny U. Back in the old days. Great for seafood. And lacrosse. Also the home of Nancy Pelosi, known back when I knew her as Nancy D'Alessandro. I sure hope she gets some of the Baltimore spirit in her and she better take the country back. She's not doing too good a job right now. We're very, very disappointed in her. We parked the bus in Virginia and borrowed a pickup truck the next morning to go into Washington, D.C., where five minutes later, Jim ran into his congressman. This is my good congressman, Sir Rodriguez, who was elected in a runoff election from West Texas, well, from Texas, from San Antonio, all the way out to West Texas, 
Congressional, 23rd Congressional District of Texas. And that was a tough battle for you, sir. It sure right? was. Let me, let me ask you, how many of you are I'm going to be up here until the war comes to an end, sir. Oh, oh my We've God. We've got to bring our men you, in. You, you, you're going to be here a good while. I hope yeah. not, but in, we might. We, well, this I, month we're going to be I, camping I think, here. I, think, I live right on the Mexican border. I've got to tell you, in Tolingo, Texas, I look out of my adobe, I see the mountains of Mexico, right? There, we leave our keys in our car. We do not lock our doors. We have no problems whatsoever with our brothers and sisters on the other side of the Rio Grande. Now, I got to ask you, Cyril, what kind of a mess is this administration getting us into by proposing and actually starting to build a wall on the Mexican border? It seems that the further, further the way you get from the border, the less they know about it, and uh, the more they think that that's going to be. And it's, it's, a, it's a good sound bite, and it sounds good symbolism, uh, but it doesn't take care of the job in the long run. Later that day, Jim took me to the Code Pink House and introduced me to the national organizers of this women's anti-war group. And through the month of September, I joined Code Pink on dozens of protests throughout D.C., everywhere from the Lincoln Memorial to the White House to the halls of the Congress and the Senate. The following morning, Jim drove the Code Pink women up to the U.S. Capitol where they crashed a press hearing and the Capitol Police wouldn't let the bus get anywhere near the Capitol. Adam Kokesh spoke to a group of protesters, and I was amazed by the fact there were so many cops carrying large rifles. I then joined Code Pink as they went to Nancy Pelosi's office. When we were in San Francisco doing a uh, hunger strike in an encampment outside our house, trying to just get a meeting with her to talk about her strategy for ending this war, she came out of her house and said, I will never meet with you. You're nuts. So we were quite hurt by that because we were sacrificing a lot to sleep out on the cement and not eat. And we have strong convictions about this war. And we don't think we're nuts. We think it's kind of nuts to say you're against the war but then keep allowing the president to get more and more billions of dollars from the war. That sounds kind of nuts to us. So we're here to deliver some nuts and leave her a note. And I mean, we don't think being passionate about peace trying to stop people from getting killed is nuts. We actually think that funding the war while trying to stop the war is kind of nutty. So we say, some would say, you've got to be nuts to keep funding the war. We look forward to meeting with you about how to get that war. Troops out of the Middle East, stop in the name of peace. Troops out of the Middle East. Later that week, I went with Code Pink to a U.S. Senate hearing on the Iraq War. There I am on C-SPAN in the Pink Tierra. Many of the senators in the room were past and future presidential candidates. I was amazed by the fact that so many senators would show up late to these hearings and leave early. On top of that, these two senators were talking the entire time even after being repeatedly told to stop talking while people gave their presentation, but they continued chit-chatting and ignoring the presentation. Wake up, America! It is time for the revolution of nonviolence, Guardian Statue, to begin. We demand that all troops be brought home from harm's way. We demand that our Congress wake up and read what the Constitution says. Bring the troops home, bring them home now. Hello, I'm Medea Benjamin with Code Pink, and we're riding along this lovely Potomac River on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, right in front of the uh, home of Speaker Nancy Pelosi when she's here in Washington, D.C. And we've been riding up and down telling people to go into her condominium building and leave her a note and tell her that the people want her to do what we voted her in to do, and that is to end the war, to bring the troops home, and stop funding this horrible occupation. So before you leave, just go in the lobby and leave a note for the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Washington.
ボルチモアこの静かな港町で平穏なサラリーマン生活を送ってきたグッドナウさん彼の生活はウォーターゲート事件をきっかけに一変してしまいました This was the first of two days of hearings where General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker gave their assessment on the war in Iraq. Members of Code Pink, the Iraq Veterans Against the War, and other activists were there to also let their voices be heard. My name is Jeff m a r t I'm the Washington, D.C. chapter president of Iraq Veterans Against the War. I'm in Cannon House office building,、um, waiting in line to hear General Petraeus' report. And I thought it was important to come by because the fact is, is that General Petraeus no longer represents soldiers. His job is not to maintain the welfare of soldiers anymore. His job isn't to make sure that soldiers come home safe. He's become a, a Facebook for the administration and a talking point for them to use in order to spread their message to Congress.、And、the fact is that someone has to speak for soldiers and someone has to be here doing that. And with nine years in the military and、uh, the last two years being active in Iraq Veterans Against the War, we brought members of Iraq Veterans Against the War here to actually represent the beliefs and feels of the military who last year over 70%. Of the U.S. military fighting in Iraq wanted to be home by the end of last year. So, I mean, the fact is, is that number is growing and growing. You see it with the growing number of members of Iraq Veterans Against the War on active duty, and that's a, a theme that should be represented here. As the public began to enter the hearing, Reverend Lennox Yearwood was denied access into the hearing because this woman from the Capitol staff claimed that he had not been in line the entire time. Even though everyone around him could attest to the fact that he had been standing in line, he was then arrested and assaulted by the Capitol Police. For yelling, arrest Bush, not Rev. Gold Star mother Cindy Sheehan was arrested, and within minutes, her sister Dee Dee was also arrested. Then, moments later, Code Pink activist Lori Perdue was arrested over a non existent stay away order. But this was only the first of many arrests that day. Inside of the hearing, the Capitol Police physically removed many of the Code Pink women from their chairs when they stood up and spoke out against General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker. Please remove them. Let me make an announcement that those who have caused the lawful conduct and the improper conduct. Are and who will, throughout the remaining, remaining of this hearing, will be prosecuted under Section 105316 of the District of Columbia, and we will prosecute them under the law. I'm here. 
here as a um, retired U.S. Army officer and also as a diplomat who resigned in opposition to the war in Iraq. And I'm here at the Atreus and uh, Parker hearings to hear what they have to say about what they, they feel is necessary for the United States to do in Iraq. I personally believe, uh, after the testimony of both of them yesterday, that still the best thing for the United States is to, uh, uh, to remove itself from, from Iraq. I left the hearing with Carlos Arredondo, where we ran into the presidential motorcade. Oh yeah, they're coming this way. There it goes. There it fucking goes. Fucking bastard. Carlos and I watched as the very people responsible for his son's death drove by. It was a truly heart-wrenching moment. Years later, Carlos saved a young man's life at the Boston Marathon bombing. Still going. Oh, what? Really? That's, that's, that's a rally, alright? Sweet, they got a big screw. That... Get the fuck out of Iraq. You must be held accountable for the arrogance, injustices, and crimes of your administration. P. Arbit. Stop the Orwellian prediction and return our civil liberties. Throughout the night, they read letters from activists from all over the country, and I slept on the lawn of the U.S. Capitol with nothing more than a thin sheet of plastic as my source of warmth. Dear Nancy Pelosi, please help to bring justice and democracy to the USA. Impeachment is appropriate. Joy Schneider. This is my campsite. Uh, Later that day, the protesters brought the thousands of letters demanding the impeachment of George W. Bush and Dick Cheney to Nancy Pelosi's office. Hello there. We just got passes to get up in the House Gallery. If we don't go to jail. I'm not from a dictatorship. I have lived one. I don't want to live in another one. Especially, I don't want my three grandchildren and the children that are coming, the third generation behind me, leaving that one. I don't think what other, she has audacity to come, get elected and say, Impeachment is off the table. We know the U.S. Constitution. This country is no different than the Islamic Republic. She has to realize that. This country is based on law. And this is the only thing that makes this country different. Islamic Republic of Iran is as capitalist as this country. But the only thing this country has built on, 200 and some years of trying to build a democracy. And she is giving it up. What right does she have? Chief of Staff closed the door on the protesters, and the protesters continued on reading the letters. What would a president have to do to get impeached if lying about our nation's national security isn't an impeachable offense? Nancy Pelosi, your silence will be your legacy. Impeach Pelosi. Back at the Code Pink House, Mona showed me the bruises caused by the Capitol Police during the General Petraeus hearings. How old are you? I'll be 70 next month. And, and how many officers grabbed you in this picture? Two, and we have a picture right here. And, 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 yeah. and you know something? I have never had a ticket in my life, and not even parking. That's great. And not only that, I'm claustrophobic. That's why I was home. No, no, please. I'll never do it again. It just shows you what they, they're stupid. They're to. capable. They're going after an old grandmother. And, and, and. Do I, do I look like a terrorist? Yeah, yeah. you do. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yeah, it. from their advice, and I have accepted General Petraeus's recommendations. I have directed General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker to update their joint campaign plan for Iraq so we can adjust our military and civilian resources accordingly. Good thumbs up, man. 
Royal Mercy. Jim and I left Virginia heading for Washington, D.C., where we attempted to stash the bus at the train station between Fox and CNN. The eve of the big demonstration, September 14th. We sat there parked between CNN and Fox until the security kindly told us that we had to leave the building. We spent the night traveling around Washington, D.C., unable to find parking. That morning, nearly 70,000 protesters gathered at the White House for a march to the U.S. Capitol. These counter-protesters later physically attacked Carlos Arredondo during the march. What's up, bro? So what organization are you guys with? We support with, the, uh, we're with the Americans. Okay. Apparently, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of those down here. facing right Yeah. I served eight and a half years so you could be an idiot like this. And I'm proud that I protected your right to hate your country. It's Saturday, 15th of September. We're coming to you from Washington, D.C. The Rose is parked at the corner of New York Avenue Northwest and 15th Street. We are witnessing the formation and the beginning of the peace march and the rally here as the marchers now prepare to depart from Lafayette Square and proceed on down towards the Capitol. We've been told by rough estimates that there's at least 70,000 participants in this march. These people are a variety of individuals, of ages, of ethnic groups. They're from all corners of this country, and I've met and talked with several individuals that have come from Europe and as far as South Africa and Australia as well, joining in on this call to end the madness of this war. And also, I might add, everybody here wants to end the madness of Georgia's presidency as rapidly as possible. The intimidation from the counter-protesters ranged all the way from ripping up activists' signs and materials to physical violence in the street. The Capitol Police stood in full riot gear, prepared for what would soon be hundreds of arrests. This is scary as fuck. Jim and I walked away from the nation's capital and I had tears in my eyes after seeing so many hundreds of arrests. We headed to the jail release center on the other side of the district where the protesters were coming in by the bus load. I saw Jeff and Chrissy and so many people I had met over the previous weeks. Adam, how many times have you been have you been arrested this week? That's that's two now. Guy's the greatest man. He's he's the dancer. He did a tap dance on top of the Yellow Rose of Texas Peace Post out in Kansas for the Marines, right? Uh, yeah. You were doing a little dance there. It looked like the Rockettes tore off one of the lights on his way down, but that's all right, man. It was worth it. So it's something to 
miles there. We're going to put this up on our blog. The Constitution of the United States of America, supreme law of the land, and one of the foundational documents of our democracy. This here pamphlet did not leave my hand from the time I stepped over the wall until two cops for forcefully pried it from my death grip. Oh no. The precinct over there. <laughs> we were in here and uh, I was holding this in my hand and the cop tried to pull it out and I said, they are trying to confiscate the Constitution from me. And everybody started standing up and then they let me hold on to it and everybody went cheering. There I was being let out and I said, people of America, fight for your freedom. And then I just kept it on, kept it going, would not shut up. I have that unique talent. When they ask me questions, I refuse to respond, of course, with the Fifth Amendment. But if they're not asking me questions and I'm busy overstating the obvious, speaking about what's right and true and just, about the cause of liberty and democracy and supporting and defending the Constitution, I will not shut up. Because I got the First Amendment. <laughs> no truer words ever spoken there. As we left the jail release, I found out that one of the activists who I met in St. Louis, a founding member of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, David Klein, had passed away the day before the march. Jim and I went to the Vietnam Memorial to join activists and veterans to show our respect for Dave Klein. First time I met Dave, uh, he was actually the first vet that I talked to as a vet. And uh, before uh, I went to Iraq, I went to an anti-war demonstration and I didn't, it was my first anti-war demonstration, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But I knew I had my green field jacket and, uh, a, butt and uh, a spot on a bus going to New York. And when I got there, it was like, you should march with the vets, you should march with the vets. And, I didn't know quite what that meant, so I walked over to this spot on the map that they said the vets were meeting. And I talked to this, you know, this old Vietnam vet the whole time about how I was worried about going to Iraq. And he never once said don't go or do go or anything. And he listened to me for the whole march. I don't know how long it was, um, but if it's one of the marches I've been involved with since, it's probably like fucking 12 hours. <laughs> But I, I complained the whole time and he barely said anything. And at the end he gave me his card and he said, whatever you decide, when you get back, you give me a call. You'll need it. And uh, I moved into an apartment on a, uh, after I got back and I was going through my old stuff and I pulled out this card that I found that said, uh, Dave Pine, Vietnam veteran actor. Later that week, Jim and I went to this African American festival held at a park there in Washington, D.C., where I met Professor Griff of the group Public Enemy and also poet, comedian, Dick Gregory. Well, let me just say, we want to put labels to just war. Aren't you war among and thugs? That you go from one place to another. And what makes what you're doing so good because it's a new mindset now. And people's beginning to listen. And they have a multi-trillion dollar machine to say we're gonna do it our way. Uh, it's about all. And the big war, I mean, y'all just give to get ready. The big war is gonna be over water. Shit, I don't live without oil. I can't live without water. And that's what this is fixing to go. It's World War Four. So what we got to do is get people's mind into And I guess the one question all us Christians got to ask ourselves is, how come, how come there are no atheists on death row? What is it about people who don't believe in God, don't kill folks? So I just want to thank you for what you're doing and enjoyed being with you on September 11th. I went to a FISA domestic surveillance hearing, and on my way there, I noticed a group of veterans for what, what I later would discover was a pro-Bush, pro-Iraq war rally. I went to the FISA hearing where many people engaged in civil disobedience. Can we interrupt?
saying i guess i don't have to go to disneyland this year um we left the domestic surveillance hearing and went across the street to the park where a pro bush rally was being held so liz tell us what we're doing well tonight we're going to pick up three of our very dedicated peace activists that were arrested this afternoon for civil disobedience and we're picking them up at the jail block this is it right here the event was called families united for troops and their mission Iraq Marine veteran Adam Kokesh was there attempting to make meaningful conversation with the attendees of the event. And to the side of the park were less than three dozen activists who were all threatened with arrest just for simply shouting. Jim is deep, deep inside the lion's den right now. They're telling us to be quiet now. They're saying we're disturbing the event. But when we had our event, the pro-war people were spitting on us. They were um, throwing stuff at us. They were destroying our, uh, our protesters' property. Um, they were pushing people. I mean, and the cops are there to protect those people who have done more to us than us standing here shouting about something. Senator Lieberman, how many more Iraqis have to die? How many more soldiers men have to die? And we got another great one, Senator Joe Lieberman. I attempted to silently film the event up close, but a woman with a large piece of paper kept jumping in front of the sight of my camera, and when I turned around, there was a Capitol Police officer telling me that if I didn't move out of the area immediately, I would be arrested. Adam Kokesh tested the limits while at the event. He was constantly told that he couldn't be anywhere near the actual rally and that he couldn't even be standing silently to the side, that he had to be in motion at all times or he could be arrested for being too close. charged with officer what know. was she charged with you are you have to inform her under amendment 6 of the constitution what is the nature and cause of the accusations to which she is facing i think this is the definition of a police state when we get arrested for reading our constitution actually i'm surprised they didn't drag more of us out there because we were yelling and uh you know uh mccain was there so i was screaming on the top of my lungs quite honestly i am surprised they didn't drag more of us out of there and they were ready but, you know, they're just getting out of hand. They're arresting me for reading the Constitution, the First Amendment I was reading. Oh, wait, the right of free speech and free assembly. They arrested me for reading the Constitution. You got arrested while reading the First Amendment. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. There's something kind of ironic I got about arrested. That. Well, see, I was wearing a pink hat. If I had been wearing a red shirt, I would have never been put in the spot with the coat pink. Hat. I was standing on the other side. So stay in the left and line. just go left. Okay. Or, you know, but they made uh, me move this is a good lane. Because right I was here wearing a pink perfect. hat. You'll be and when I right moved, I moved. guess that made yeah, it unlawful assembly. <laughs> yeah, it is. How dare you go where the police told you to go? <laughs> Arresting people for reading the Constitution as we speak. 
And they won't let us let them know. Is there any charges? What happened to you, Chris? What, what were you doing? I was waving a copy of the Constitution. I saw you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I was grabbed by cops on both sides, and I said, "What are the charges?" Yeah, and they don't tell you. And Wait, you weren't even the Constitution. You weren't even. Too. You weren't even talking. You were just waving it. Right. Well, she was whispering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was, was, was just saying. I was whispering. Don't leave her the Antichrist. <laughs> 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 This is the first day, day one, of the encampment in front of the Capitol where we have set up some big scaffolding with a big sign saying Congress cut off the war funding, canopies, tents, a stage, and we're going to be here all week. And we're going to be here as a challenge to Congress that they could stop the war now if they stopped funding the war. They have the power to do it, they have the constitutional authority to do it, they have the obligation to do it. And they could do it simply by not putting war funding on the table. Don't bring it out of committee. The same way that Nancy Pelosi said that the impeachment of George W. Bush is off the table, what we're saying is she should put impeachment on the table and take war funding off the table. And we're here as a challenge on this, planning for a major demonstration September 29th, but also doing the day-to-day -day building right here in D.C. While America's poor dodge bullets in foreign lands watching from slaughter, still hunger and fighting for country or college funds, or just because you want to get home, realize that no matter how many are killed with you, you still die alone for the benefit of rich men. Whereas in a multi-party system, you have an incentive to collaborate. Because while we may disagree on this issue, on another issue, I may want your party to be my ally. So I don't want to diss your party. What I want to do is firmly state my beliefs on each issue so you want and, to your and do it in a way that encourages collaboration so that other parties can, can begin to see a creative solution that works for everybody. Please tell the camera your little secret. I'm currently AWOL from the United States Army. And why are you AWOL? Because I refuse to go kill Muslims. When, when there's homeless dying here, you know, I'm not going to go back and kill more people. The money should be spent here, helping our country. During the encampment at the U.S. Capitol, it was just commonplace to see Capitol and Metro Police walking around with automatic rifles and flash grenades. Do you feel safer knowing there's large assault rifles around your children? No, actually, I, I don't feel safer. I feel a lot more threatened and I, I, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm blown away. I haven't seen this since I lived in Kuwait and, and uh, even in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, the officers carried smaller rifles than that. So. I gotta say that that's really scary. The fact that they're walking around with them pointed at people. At the encampment, students from around the country got together to plan a spontaneous protest. At one point, protesters went inside of a military recruiting station and took all of their literature. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve cop cars. Oh, even that thing's chasing us. When the protesters got to the U.S. Capitol, the police were there in riot gear, but no arrests were made. The SWAT team later stopped by to check the permit for the encampment, and the Secret Service was parked nearby.
As the march ended, protesters began occupying Pennsylvania Avenue. Jim and I left thinking that there was going to be massive arrests, but when we returned a few hours later, we were surprised to see that the protesters had actually begun setting up tents in the middle of the street. Well, basically, the people have camped out here in the streets, reclaiming this street as an anti-war street. We've had the police actually negotiate with us to allow one lane of traffic open for emergency vehicles. When they violated that negotiation, we blocked the traffic again, sent the traffic back down the street, at which case they came out and the police apologized to us and have blocked off the lanes. They're afraid to approach us right now. <laughs> Holy shit! Well, it's just unprecedented what's happened here today. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in years, decades of uh, all different struggles in the movement. Very creative tactics. The youth decided on their own. They held a sit-in in the street. They blocked traffic on one intersection, moved to another, called a sit-in on another, and they have stopped Pennsylvania Constitution, 4th Street here, for hours at a time. Uh, it seems that the police have made a decision not to move in and arrest, I think because there's a real crime about to take place at the Capitol. They don't want world attention on it, and an arrest does bring that kind of attention. That's why the youth have decided to take the very action they did, to stop the war, even if it means stopping traffic to draw attention. It's amazing to see like the power of the people, the power of youth and students to you know, occupy and shut down D.C. for six hours, um, you know, was a big step forward for, for youth and students, for the movement in general, as far as moving from protest to resistance and really All right, challenge the war. So I think this is awesome. Uh, yeah. And I hope that I think continues so. to happen. The protest moved from Pennsylvania Avenue back towards the U.S. Capitol where the encampment had ended earlier that day. From there, the demonstrators would travel to their homes throughout the country, and along with us, we would bring a small piece of that protest. We returned to Philadelphia to get more biodiesel for the bus, but we also needed a break from Washington, D.C. The month of September had been hard, seeing hundreds of people arrested and brutalized by the police for standing up to the Bush administration and the wars overseas. We spent some time there in Philadelphia and I sat on the top of a building and filmed the city thinking about all of the hundreds of people that I had met and the stories I had documented. Jim was born in Maryland, but he was a cowboy in so many ways, not just living in Terlingua, Texas, but he had actually been in a Clint Eastwood Western called Paint Your Wagon, where Jim played one of the miners. See, just driving this today, tens of thousands of people are going to see the signage on your donut pack of random people. Jim Goodnow and I returned to New York City with the Yellow Rose of Texas Peace Bus and a posse of people, and this time I was not afraid to use the megaphone as we drove through Times Square. We placed the megaphone on the roof of the bus so that everybody within a two block vicinity would be able to hear us. Oh, but you gotta be loud. Bring home the troops! Impeach George Bush and Dick Cheney for war crimes! Keep it up, man, they're all looking. Enough is enough! Support the troops, bring them home! Don't Iraq Iran! Impeach the criminals in the Oval Office! Bring them home! End the war in Iraq! Texas for peace, 
Texas for impeachment. Okay, I'll try to do it because it costs. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Put it again. Yeah. Now he's on his cell phone. How you doing? Great, how are you? What do you think about peace? I think peace is necessary. How fucking crazy is America when you have a TV school? There we were at the military recruiting station in the middle of Times Square. An AWOL soldier who left the war and came back to the United States. I was told that a few months later he turned himself in. Along the way in New Jersey, we often we would see on these overpasses these Ron Paul Revolution banners. We received many thumbs up from people driving by and even one person who gave us the middle finger. Hi! Oh! Middle finger! Middle finger! A finger! Dun 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 dun! We're on finger patrol! This trip to Atlantic City was the last adventure that Jim Goodnow and I took together on the Yellow Rose Peace Bus. Later that week, he dropped me off in Washington, D.C., where I documented one more Code Pink protest before returning to Wisconsin. Jim and I had seen protests from Missouri to Maine and documented an important time in American history. Yeah. Okay. It says my posse right here. Okay, honey. Go up to her website up here and check it out, okay? Okay, honey. We'll see you later. Yeah. Alright, bye. <laughs> She's sweet. We just wasted money at a casino for the first time ever. How boring. Very boring. Wasted money. Yeah, and the Don's and the Don's casino no less. Donald Trump. Diversion, diversion, diversion. People dying, people bleeding out. Everybody going along here playing slot machines. Like nothing's happening. Time to wake up, America. I left Washington, D.C. that week on a train headed for the Midwest. I had a lot of time to sit there and think about the epic journey I had just been on with Jim Goodnow and the Yellow Rose Peace Bus. It was a life-changing adventure that gave me the strength to speak up for which I believe in. I made my way back to Wisconsin, and my mother was very happy that I hadn't been ticketed or arrested. A few months later, the Yellow Rose Peace Bus mysteriously went up in flames. Jim safely made his way off the bus. This coincidentally happened just days after Jim had driven the Yellow Rose alongside John McCain's bus. Five years later, in the desert of Terlingua, Texas, Jim Goodnow's heart stopped beating, and he died in the desert just like he would have wanted it to be. His friends and family and I spread his ashes in that ghost town he loved so much. He was the greatest inspiration I've ever had. God bless the young people. I'm so happy because I'm getting towards my twilight here. It's getting 
approaching winter but year. And when I die, I don't want to die thinking we didn't fight a good struggle. And, We're fighting for uh, it. Manning, man, just be free, my brother. And we're with you. And the spirit is there, the collective consciousness. Is that okay?